and welcome to Changemakers. In this program, we feature conversations with people in our society who are making a change, making a difference, making an impact. Our guest today is Mike Robbins, a former baseball star with Stanford University and the Kansas City Royals. Mike is a well-known author, public speaker, personal development expert, and he's the author of two books, Focus on the Good Stuff, The Power of Appreciation, and Be Yourself, Because Everybody Else is Taken. Both these books have been translated into over 10 languages, and Mike's been featured in hundreds of TV programs and radio stations, including Oprah Radio and ABC News. He's also been featured in the Washington Post, Forbes, and Fast Company. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Pleasure Thank to have you. Yeah, glad to be here. Well, baseball star all the way to motivational speaker. That's yeah. an interesting kind of <laughs> transformation. How did that happen? Well, I mean, essentially, I grew up here in the Bay Area up in Oakland, and I actually got drafted by the New York Yankees out of high school. Wow. Didn't end up signing with the Yankees because I got a scholarship to play just down the road at Stanford, which was a dream for me. I got the chance to pitch in the College World Series. Got drafted by the Kansas City Royals, signed a pro contract at 21. All I ever wanted to do since I was a little kid was yeah. you know, pitch in the major leagues. Unfortunately, my third season in the minors with Kansas City, I went out to pitch one night, threw one pitch, tore ligaments in my elbow, blew my arm out. Ouch. So there I was, 23 years old, yeah. you know, didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. After a few surgeries and finally, you know, realizing I wasn't going to get a chance to play baseball again, I came back to the Bay Area. I got a job in the dot-com world. It was the late 90s, and that's sort of what everybody was doing. Interesting. Rode the dot-com yeah. wave for a couple <laughs> years. Dot-com bubble burst. I lost my job. You know, and what ultimately those two experiences, both hurting my arm and my baseball career ending, and then you know, losing my dot-com job, which I wasn't all that passionate about anyway, yeah. but in a very short amount of time, you know, two big things happened. And what I realized from that whole experience, and I write a lot about and focus on the good stuff, especially related to my baseball career, was when it was all said and done, my big regret wasn't that I didn't make it to the major leagues. It was I didn't fully appreciate it while it was happening. So, you know, as I had that my personal awakening, if you will, I started to speak about it. I started to write about it. I started to share it with other people. Yeah. And, you know, about 10 years ago, I didn't really know if I could actually you know, create any kind of a living or a business or actually reach anybody with it. It was more sort of my own personal journey and process, but eventually people started inviting me to come and speak to their groups at their churches and schools and even companies. And 10 years later, here I am talking to you. Fantastic. <laughs> now, and I've heard you speak in a couple times before and I've read yeah. the book. And, and one of the things I understand is it's actually during the darkest days of the dot-com boom that you had this idea for this book about. Yeah. So to, what exactly happened? There's like one critical meeting that you talk about. Right. You tell us a story. Well, I mean, well, one of the stories from my, from my dot-com experience that was interesting. So I was, you know, not that many months removed from having my baseball career end. I get this job. I'm working in San Francisco. And in fact, you know, the dot-com boom is going. And I was working on the sales team for a company in San Francisco. And we, there were a bunch of sales teams around the country for this company. We yeah. sort of repped a bunch of websites. Anyway, one day I you get all inspired march into my manager's office and say, Brian, I want to talk to the sales team on Wednesday at the sales meeting. And he kind of asked me what I want to talk about. And I told him I want to try to motivate the team. And uh, anyway, he says, okay, and, you know, writes it down. So, he, you know, he's going to put me down on the agenda. Well, I come in that morning to talk at the meeting and I wasn't inspired anymore, you know, and the meeting sort of starts and it's kind of negative as it often is. You know, I'd always say there was a couple unwritten rules <coughs> about these meetings. And I'm sure a lot of people listening or watching us can relate to this. You had to come to the meeting in a bad mood. You had to complain as much as possible. And, you know, no matter what was going on in the meeting, you had to sort of be annoyed to be there and in a hurry and want to get out. That was kind of how every meeting went. Yeah. And this one was going sort of like that, and everybody was really annoyed and irritated and trying to get out. And He'd passed out agendas, and my name was just the sixth point and the last point on the agenda. It just said Mike Robbins. And they get done with point number five, and all of a sudden the meeting starts to kind of wrap up. And people start to leave. Yeah. So I think, cool, maybe I'm off the hook because I don't really want to give my little <laughs> motivational talk anyway. And then all of a sudden, you know, he goes, hold on, hold on a second, everybody yeah. come back, sit back down. I forgot Robin's over here and wants to try to motivate you yeah. guys. <laughs> so everybody sits back down. Now they're sort of looking at me like, okay, what's, what's so he That's the pitch. Mike Robbins is going to motivate you Exactly. Guys. And, the, you know, and I stand up and now like my heart is like yeah. jumping out of my chest. I'm so nervous and I look at everybody. Like, well, I've been thinking, what if we work together as a team? What if we, pre I mean, cheesy as can be, right? Yeah. And they're sort of looking at me like I'm nuts. 
And finally, I realized, Gopi, I was talking to them about something. I wasn't showing them what I meant. And what I did was one by one, I went around the table and I started to acknowledge each person and let each of them know in a genuine way some things I appreciated about yeah. them. And I, I, it wasn't planned, it wasn't rehearsed, I just sort of spontaneously started to do it. And I went around the whole room and I got done and I sort of didn't have anything else to say and I sat down. And then it was like this awkward silence and, and I'm thinking, you know, did I do something wrong? Yeah. But it wasn't that there was anything wrong, it was just people didn't really know how to respond and then eventually someone said something and someone else said something and all of a sudden this conversation started and we ended up in that conference room for another hour after everybody had you know been out the door and we had the most amazing discussion like we'd never had talking about lots of ideas and ways we could support each other and sure. be more successful and something started to really go off in my own because I was so excited about the meeting and how it had turned out and it wasn't just the meeting itself it's what started to change on our team yeah. because eventually over the next few weeks and months as we moved through the quarter we started to come together more, we started to see some results. Yeah. And by the next quarter, we were the number one performing sales team in the company. And all of a sudden, I was like, you know what? I don't want to sell internet advertising anymore. I want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> so that was kind of, you know, among many other experiences I had in sports. And then as I got into business a little bit, I started to realize, you know what? A lot of these things that I go in and now get hired to speak to corporations and teams and groups about, it's personal life stuff for my own experience and some basic things that I think a lot of us know about how to motivate ourselves and each other. That's right. what Focus on the Good Stuff's all about. Yeah. But how do we bring them together in a group or team environment in an authentic way so it really can bring people together and motivate them? So starting with that one accidental motivational speech that you right. were forced to give, here's Mike Robbins' motivational <laughs> speaker. Uh, you've gone on, now you speak. Week in, day after day, you're speaking in front of so many different audiences, energizing them, taking your message out. Yeah. You know, wh what what motivates you as a motivational speaker to want to go and motivate other people? Well, that's a great question. I think, you know, for me, m one of my core beliefs is that we teach best what we most need to learn. Yeah. So a lot of this in a, you know, and I'm pretty straightforward about this, in a self-serving way, everything that I write about, everything I speak about is part of what I'm continuing to learn, if you will. So I think the thing that motivates me the most, you know, from that original experience of hurting my arm and having my baseball career by that dream come to an end. I think that we live in a culture that is obsessed with what's next or the grass is always greener or yeah. it's not good now, it's gonna be good better when I lose some weight, when I fall in love, when I get a new job, when I make a million dollars, fill in the blank. And look, I still deal with that in my own life. So, but I, here we are, especially here we are in the middle of Silicon Valley, are you kidding? Like the sort of epicenter of not only technology but in the Bay Area in California yeah. where there's so much abundance. You know, I know you just recently traveled to India and there's, you know, you go anywhere, even other places in this country, or especially around the world, yeah. and you realize how incredibly thank, you know, grateful and abundant we could be and should be about everything that we have. Yeah. But so often I think it's easy to complain, to not see it, if you will. And so that's, you know, what motivates me. I think of actually an experience I had in a taxi cab a couple of years ago in Houston. I just got done speaking at an event for Chevron mm -hmm. and I was sort of rushing to the airport and trying to get there fast. and you know, feeling sort of important about myself, if you will. And, and I start to have this conversation with the cab driver, a really interesting guy. And he has a, this accent that I can't quite make out. And, yeah. and I didn't, first I didn't ask him, and then we get talking, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out where you're from. Could you just tell me where you're from? And he said, I'm from Ethiopia originally. Yeah. And I said, cool, well, and he, he says, but listen, I've been here for 20 years. I got two teenage sons. I'm I really, you know, I'm an American. And I said, great, and we keep talking. And right before we get to the airport, Gopi, I asked him, I said, what's your perspective on this culture given, you know, you didn't grow up here? Sure. He pulls the cab over and he turns around and he looks me right in the eye and he said, can I tell you the truth? And I said, yeah, please. He said, well, I think most people in this culture act like spoiled brats. Wow. And I said, why do you say that? He said, listen, Mike, I'm from Ethiopia. Every day here is a good day. So, you know, for me, I had just given a talk on appreciation. Right. And that man said in one sentence something so profound that yeah. I think about it all the time. And to me, that's the essence of what I'm out speaking about, what I'm intending to remind other people of, and myself in the process, yeah, yeah. essentially, especially about appreciation, is that it's not so much about what we do, what we have, what we accomplish. Yeah. It's a function of how much we appreciate it. You know, I'm still young enough. If I hadn't gotten hurt, I could still be playing baseball. Yeah. I could be pitching for the Kansas City Royals or the New York Yankees or the San Francisco Giants in the major leagues making millions of dollars. Yeah. And I know for sure, because I work with some professional athletes, there's no guarantee that just because I were doing that, I would be happy and fulfilled. It would be a function of how much I was appreciating it and myself in the process. And that's true for all of us, whether we work at a technology company in Silicon Valley, 
whether we're a professional athlete, whether we stay at home with our kids, whether we have any kind of occupation, yeah. it's not what we're doing. It's are we enjoying and actually appreciating it and the people around us in the process. Exactly. And in this case, it took an outsider to come in and look inside and, and remind us of it, the Ethiopian taxi driver. Absolutely. Okay. So, and I think a lot of times, I mean, a lot of this stuff, it's simple. It's in some ways basic, if you will. But we get so caught up in life and we get so busy and so focused on what's wrong or we get so focused, you know, our culture, as you know, is just like obsessed with negativity, is obsessed with fear, is obsessed with worry, gossip. I mean, you turn on the news, you, yeah. turn, you read the newspaper, you ha listen to conversations around the water cooler or at family gatherings. Most of what we're talking about isn't how wonderful things are, how grateful we are, how you know, f fantastic it is to see you, how blessed we feel. It's really often about what's wrong, you know, people are complaining about politicians, the economy, people they don't like, whatever the case is. Yeah. And I think it's easy for all of us to get caught up in that if we're not conscious about it. Okay. So tell me, I'm curious about something. When you were 23 years old, you yes. had your dream set. Mm -hmm. You're going to play in the major leagues yeah. and suddenly you hurt your arm and your entire baseball career is, uh, is destroyed. Yes. And at that point, did you just get caught up in the, in the in your miserable state or did you make a mental shift and still appreciate everything going on around you? What happened then? I think it was, it's a, it's a good question. I think it was a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I think I had the awareness. I mean, sometimes like in the midst of tragedy, yeah. um, with all the different emotions, I know I've experienced this, maybe you have, and I'm sure people watching, you know, there is a, a sobering, a, a sort of an awakening. And I did have an awakening. I would say there was a lot. I mean, I went through, as I write about and focus on the good stuff, um, a couple pretty significant periods of depression myself where you know, who am I? What's life about? It sort of woe is me. This isn't fair. Yeah. And I think, you know, as I look back now and have compassion for that 23-year-old man, young man who was going through that experience, sure. it, it was very natural, very normal. But thankfully, one of the things I made a commitment to Gopi at the time was like, I'm not going to be that guy sitting at the end of the bar in my 50s and 60s and 70s, yeah. you know, saying I could have been somebody or I used to be so great or, you know, that whole sort of glory day phenomenon. Which, yeah. and, and so I decided, you know, look, this isn't what I wanted. This has been incredibly painful, but at some deep level, not just the cliche, everything happens for a reason, but yeah. there, I knew there was something about it that was meant to be. And you know, just a couple weeks ago, I had an experience related to this that was really moving for me. I was driving my four-year-old, Samantha, mm -hmm. to a baseball game, college baseball. Actually, yeah. Stanford and Cal were playing over at Berkeley, yeah. and she was off on spring break from preschool. So I took the half day off work and took her to the game, just me and her. She likes going to baseball games. And we're driving in the car, and Samantha's sitting in the back in her car seat, and she says, Daddy, are you going to play in the game today? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, sweetie, Daddy doesn't play anymore. She'd seen me play in an alumni game yeah. at Stanford a couple years ago, so yeah. she's a little confused. I said, no, Daddy's not going to play. I don't play anymore. Well, why not? She starts asking me lots of questions. You know, Dad, and I'm trying to explain to a four-year-old, you know, well, Daddy got a boo-boo on his arm, and yeah. he can't do it, you know, this whole thing. And so finally she starts to get it, and she says, well, well are you sad? And I said, well, no, I'm, I was. When it happened, I was sad. But uh, no, I'm not sad anymore. And I said, in fact, I'm grateful that it happened. And she says, grateful? Like she, you know, why are you grateful? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that, it didn't hurt and wasn't that bad? And I said, well, yeah, sweetie, but if daddy never got hurt, I never would have met mommy. And I said, and if wow. I never met mommy, I'd never be your daddy. <laughs> And there I am in my car as yeah. I'm telling her this, and I start to cry, and I have to like <laughs> almost pull the car over. I'm like, now I don't know if she got it, yeah. but I got it, and was like, it was like another level of wow. And it struck you just at that moment. In, in a, in a, as I was just in the interaction of it, in the yeah. realness of it, as I was explaining it to my daughter, something even deeper hit me, like, you know. And I think most of us, as I share my story around the country with different groups of people, so many people come up. To, I mean, very few people have this same story. Although I do meet people from time to time who've had sports injuries, but everybody has a story yeah. of something that happened that seemed horrendous at the time. Yeah. That then in hindsight, not only does it seem okay, it's like, thank God that happened. You know, there's a Garth Brooks song from years ago, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers, and he talks about, you know, that whole phenomenon. Yeah. I think, and whether it's a tragedy or a difficulty, or even the stresses and struggles that we may face in our daily lives yeah. right now, there's so much beauty we can see in it. Now, the challenge for us on our personal journey, whether it's professionally or personally, is in the midst of the struggle, yeah. can we see the proverbial silver lining? Right. You know, like right now, with the, what's been going on in the economy is a lot of the companies and organizations that hire me and bring me in, whatever I'm talking to them about, I'm talking yeah. some version of dealing with adversity, dealing with change, dealing with uncertainty. And what I say to everybody about it, I said, look, 
part of what makes right now scary collectively for a lot of people is yeah. we don't know how it's going to turn out. Do you know what I mean? We fast forward five years, ten years, we can look back and in hindsight go, oh, well, the downturn and that, you know, in 2008, 2009, 2010, it all made sense. Mm -hmm. But right now there's people sort of hanging on for dear life, not Correct. sure, am I going to lose my job? Yeah. What's going to happen? But I think the people that are the most relaxed and peaceful in, in this time yeah. are the ones that are embracing the uncertainty yeah. and choosing to find the good stuff in the midst of the challenge. Yeah. So uh, now I understand that when you were at Stanford, you were friends or peers with Tiger Woods, mm -hmm. and later you were roommates with Alex Rodriguez. Yeah. And you look at all these athletes and where their career has gone. Yes. And do you sometimes sit back and wonder that <laughs> I could have been one of those people? Yeah, so I actually played, Alex Rodriguez and I were teammates on Team USA, okay. actually before I got to Stanford in, in high school. So it was a high school all-star team. And then Tiger Woods and I lived in the same suite, essentially, the same complex at Stanford, although a couple years apart, he's a couple years younger than I am. So Alex, I got to know pretty well. Tiger, not as well. But being around those two athletes, about as you know, talented and successful as you can get in now Major League Baseball and you know professional golf, yeah. you know off the field and off the you know course things notwithstanding, those guys are incredible athletes. Yeah. And you know, yes, absolutely. I do every now and again as I see Alex Rodriguez on TV, you know, in the World Series for the Yankees, or know that he signed a two hundred fifty-two million dollar contract a few yeah. years ago, or look at what Tiger Woods is worth, or see. I think to myself now. I never had quite the talent of either, either of those two guys, but, you know, I hung around and talked to them and was sort of, I do have a moment where I think, boy, it's, it's a little different from my life. But at the same time, if I look at those two guys in particular as athletes, um, and, and my girlfriend at Stanford was actually a woman named Jenny Thompson who has 10 Olympic gold medals. Yes. So, you know, to be around and in, sort of interact with people like that, I learned a couple things from them. First of all, they're just human beings, incredibly talented human beings, yeah. but just human beings. And you probably know this, you know, working at Google and being around incredible people. Sure. It's like, they're people now, extraordinary. But the second thing, though, is that even with extraordinary talent, yeah. unbelievable belief in themselves, mm -hmm. just an unbelievable sense of, like, just a knowing, kind of a, a, a will that just says, I'm going to be successful. And is that what differentiates them from other athletes? I think so. I mean, yeah. one of the things, Gopi, that fascinated me as an athlete, and this is part of probably why I was already predisposed to be interested in kind of personal development, human development, psychology, you know, what makes us tick, yeah. is, you know, someone at the level of Tiger Woods or Alex Rodriguez or Jenny Thompson, so much talent, you know, not a lot of people can play at that level simply because of the talent. But when you even get to that level of talent relative you know, or intelligence, if we're talking business, there's what makes the difference isn't talent. It really is something else. It's a how do you overcome adversity? How do you pick yourself up when you fall down? And yeah. watching people, I would watch athletes go out and compete who weren't as talented as the next athlete but do better and say, there's something about that. Mm -hmm. And I believe at some level, and I write about some of my experiences as an athlete and some of the athletes I competed with yeah. in Focus on the Good Stuff, that I think it's a belief and an expectation to succeed. Yeah you know, and also an ability to appreciate oneself without necessarily being arrogant about it, but just knowing, you know, I've got something valuable. Yeah. And I think that's true in life. If you think about people who are the most charismatic, the most magnetic, and ultimately the most successful and fulfilled, it's not that they're necessarily the most extraordinary people. There's mm -hmm. just a belief that it's going to work out. I'm going to show up and good things are going to happen or something like that. And I think, you know, there's too much evidence that we can all look at either anecdotally or even specifically yeah. that says that success and fulfillment isn't about A plus B equals C. There's some other magical element in it that no one can quite describe. In yeah. sports, we call it being in the zone. An athlete gets in the zone and like can't miss a shot in basketball. It's right. like, what the hell is that? Well, yeah. it's some phenomenon that happens. And I believe, again, without making it too corny, it's actually a belief and a positive thinking mentality that's genuine that carries you know, one person over the next in a situation with equal talent because someone believes it's going to happen. Okay, so that might be a good lead into a question that I wanted to ask you. So I want, let's say I want our viewers to be educated about how to actually bring your books into practice in their life. Okay. So if you were to take the first one, focus on the good stuff, yes. the power of appreciation. Uh, what would you tell the average person on how they can practice the power of appreciation in their life? What should they do Monday morning? Well, the, fir the first thing that is important for everybody to do, and why I spend the whole first third of the book talking about what makes it difficult for us to focus on the good stuff, yeah. is to take some inventory and tell the truth about the negativity in our own lives. Like, what, where do we get stuck? Where do we get stopped? Is it gossip? 
Is it worrying? Is it complaining? Is it judgment, being judgmental or comparing ourselves to other people? All very normal, natural things that we do. Sure. But the more we can identify it and identify where it exists in the environment around us at work and at home, not judgmentally, not, oh, see that jerk that I work with, yeah. or, oh, my mother was always so critical. No, but just, oh, notice the negativity. That's the first step. Yeah. And see where you can start to disengage from it at least a little bit, start mm -hmm. to be aware of it. Because negativity in our culture, Gopi, is kind of like when the air conditioner's on in a room and you think it's quiet, yeah. you don't even hear it until it goes off and you go, man, that was loud. Yeah. So that's the first step. The second step is to start to consciously practice being grateful. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we do that? A couple simple things you can do. One is, you know, at our house, we call it the grateful game. Now, I have two little girls, Samantha, who's four, and Anna Rose, who's a year and a half, yeah. but we will sit around the table and we sit down like you do sometimes on Thanksgiving, and Samantha often will lead it and say, Daddy, let's play the grateful game. Yeah. And we'll go yeah. around the table. What are you grateful for? Yeah. Or, you know, if you call my cell phone, it says, hey, thanks for calling. You know, this is Mike, leave me a message. In your message, let me know something you appreciate about yourself. Yeah. Or on our office line, it says, let us know something you're grateful for. So asking other people what they're grateful for and thinking about it. You know, Oprah Winfrey's been talking for years about writing in a gratitude journal. Yeah. Whatever it is, you don't want it to be corny and feel funny for yourself yeah. necessarily. But creating an attitude but, of gratitude. Yeah, but, cr but it's also creating a simple practice. Okay. You know, there's also something, and maybe people saw the movie The Secret or have yeah, heard about yeah. that. They talk about in the movie, put a gratitude rock in your pocket or yeah. in your purse. You know, something you see and touch. It doesn't matter what it is, but something that has you not just once a year or some funny, just on a regular basis. So that's the second piece, gratitude. The third piece is starting to look for ways to acknowledge other people. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a big one, especially in relationships, whether they're professional relationships or personal ones, is find things about other people that you appreciate and be willing to let them know. For no reason, not yeah. because they did something necessarily, not because you want something, but just because. Write them a card, look them in the eye and tell them, hey, this is what I appreciate about yeah. you, you know? And do it proactively, do it generously, do it in a way, and other people will sometimes feel funny or get uncomfortable about it, but do it anyway. Yeah. You know, I sometimes do it when I'm traveling because otherwise I'll get stuck in complaining and whining and feeling sorry for myself that I have to sit in an airport or blah, blah, whatever. Yeah. But I'll look around the airport and catch people doing things right or that I like and go over and just acknowledge them spontaneously. Now, they often think I'm crazy, yes. right? But when they can tell I'm genuine and sincere, it not only makes their day, but it makes mine. And all of a sudden, there's a connection that happens. Absolutely. And the final piece, and this is probably the most important and the most challenging, okay. and it actually segues kind of into some of what's in be yourself, yes, everyone okay. else has already taken, is that we got to do a much better job at appreciating ourselves. Mm -hmm. So a couple simple things that people can do to start appreciating themselves. Yeah. First of all is notice that little gremlin in your head that we all have that's constantly criticizing, you know, everything. Yeah. You name it, from like the little voice in my head that will watch this interview after and will critique how I look and how I'm sitting and what's wrong and yeah. why did you say that and you were talking too fast and yeah. that one. He's loud and big and dominant. Exactly. <laughs> but start to get familiar with that voice yeah. so you can realize it's just a voice, it's not the truth to move it aside. But we can start to appreciate ourselves. It's not arrogance, it's not bragging. It's really being able to value ourselves one simple way we can do it, although not that easy, is when people compliment us, is just to say thank, thank you, you and receive their compliment. Mm -hmm. We don't have to agree or disagree. Yeah. We don't have to give a compliment back. And we definitely don't have to blow it off and say, oh, no, no, I, you know, <laughs> which is often what we do, yeah. but really to receive it. And one of my favorite exercises, and I actually write about this in Be Yourself and do this sometimes in workshops, and this is a little out there for some people, but is to write yourself a letter of appreciation, a real heartfelt, genuine letter, and write it to yourself. Okay. And when you get it done, all done with it, and you really want to kind of pour it out, almost like, as funny as it sounds, a love letter to yourself, sure. you take it, you fold it up, yeah. put it in an envelope, put your name and address on it, put a stamp on it, give it to someone you trust, and say, listen, do me a favor, yeah. sometime in the next year, and don't tell me when, drop this in the mail. Mm -hmm. And then sometime, whether it's a week or a month or a year later, you will get this letter in the mail, and it'll be a letter from you, appreciating yourself. Beautiful. And I met somebody yesterday who said that sometimes he just orders flowers for himself and like it comes to, could sit in the office and it's Absolutely. the best way to say you love yourself. Well, you know, one of the things, look, one of the biggest reasons we get into conflicts in any of our relationships, whether yeah. they're at work or at home, is because we don't feel appreciated, right? We don't feel like the other person sees us, values us, or, you know, at some level, people don't often say it out loud like that, but that's usually the source of most frustrations or conflicts. And my wife, Michelle, has been a great teacher for me in this because when we first started dating, Gopi, about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. she used to do this thing that at first I thought was a little annoying, yeah. but then I got to really appreciate. And she would raise her hand and say, I would like to be acknowledged. And I'd be like, 
<laughs> for what? <laughs> what? what? And, and she would say, well, listen. Yeah. And finally, after a few times, she told me what it was. She said, listen, I've been dating guys for years and this and that. And, you know, I would often get annoyed that they wouldn't notice things or, you know, I'd be frustrated they didn't notice my hair or something that I right. did or whatever. So I just decided that I'm going to tell you when I would like to be acknowledged and you can acknowledge me for that. And what was funny about it, you know, my wife is very straightforward, but I started to then understand what was important to her and what she wanted to be acknowledged for. Mm -hmm. And in the process, not only did she ask for what she wanted and then she got it, she started to train me to pay attention to things from her perspective. So we can often ask for it, even though we may not think that we can. And that's a great way for us to take care of ourselves, if yeah. you will, and ultimately appreciate ourselves. Wow. Now, it looks like, so she started with an asking for appreciation and also forcing your authenticity into the whole mix as well. Absolutely. So you know, living those books in the, that's fair, right. well, you the know, dining table. Another one of my favorite sayings is, you know, the yeah. answer is always no if you don't ask. So if we don't ask for whatever it is we want in life and then we don't get it, we often set ourselves up to be upset. So one last question as we, you know, get to the end of the show. So there's the red book, the blue book. I understand Samantha is responsible <laughs> for these colors. And now she's asked you to write the green book. Yes. What is that all about? Yeah, so my, yeah, my daughter, my four-year-old, you know, the red one came out. And then she said she wanted this one to be blue. I told the publisher it came out blue. So now she takes credit and claims book three uh, is going to be green. Yeah. Although, you know, we'll see. But yeah, I'm, I'm in the process, the early stages of working on my next book, which is really going to kind of follow on this theme, appreciation, authenticity, and then ultimately self-love which is really the core of all of it, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not easy to do, but something that's essential for all of us. I look forward to it, having you back on the show. I mean, clearly this is a family business. <laughs> Our guest today is Mike Robbins, the author of the book, Focus on the Good Stuff, The Power of Appreciation, and Be Yourself Because Everybody Else is Taken. You can find out more about Mike Robbins at his site, www.mike.com dash Robbins, and that is R-O-B-B-I-N-S dot com. Mike, thank you very much for joining us on the show. It's been a pleasure having you on this program. Thanks for having thank me. You.